Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for this session. Uh, we're going to be talking about winning them back, the psychology behind retail redesign. Uh, and this whole group, there are four of them, are all joining us from London. So we're going to hear the uh, London perspective. Um, cues, store bouncers, masks, temperature checks, stand here, stand there, don't touch anything, don't touch me. Um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty wild time and um, ensuring a sense of safety is necessary. Um, and we also need to, at the same time, be careful about designing experiences that make us, uh, that don't make us feel afraid or stressed out or out of control uh, for those that have um, ventured out and gone into sort of physical retail environments. Um, there's definitely a strange vibe out there. So during this talk, we're, we'll tap into the psychology um, to help us um, redesign stores that speak to our human needs at a subconscious level. Um, our moderator today is Sandy Hernandez. She's a retailing consumer trend spotter and strategist. Uh, she helps companies innovate um, their customer experiences to profitably drive brand love. Um, we're also joined by Kate Nightingale. Kate is a customer psychologist and a human brands expert. She's also the founder of Style Psychology Limited, uh, a human experience consultancy with a twist. We're going to be joined by Ian Johnston. He's the founder of Quinine, um, a leading retail experience consultancy devoted to the power of design to drive innovation and growth. And finally, we are joined by Anthony Tasgal. Anthony runs his own training company and is course director for the Chartered Institute of Marketing, the Market Research Society, the Institute of Internal, Communic Internal Communication, and quite a few more. I'll let him, I'll let him expound on that. Um, but yeah, so we're really excited to have everyone and I'm excited to uh, give the stage to everyone. Um, Sandy, you are up. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Um, so thanks, Jeff. So my name is Sandy Hernandez, as, as Jeff kindly introduced all of us. Um, so during this talk, live from London, we're going to tap into the world of psychology to help you do three things. Um, number one is um, empathize with what your customers and employees are feeling, anticipate what they'll need and desire, and predict how they will act in the coming months. And number two, we're going to learn from retail reopening strategies that are working well and not so well. And lastly, number three, we're going to get inspired to design spaces and experiences that stand out and that win back your customers. So I don't see, are you, the other panelists on? Just if you put your videos on, that would be great. Hi. So great, hi. So we have Kate, Taz, and Ian as well. Great, hi everyone. Okay. So I think firstly, we're gonna just start by stepping into the mind of the consumer, the, the human. So as people and as a society, we've definitely been on an emotional journey during the pandemic. So I'd like to start with Kate. Um, where are we now as, as human beings, as customers, at, as stores and the economy start to reopen? What are people feeling now? What psychological needs and desires are we craving? So um, first, we need to kind of understand that we all obviously went through an extreme uh, sort of waves of uh, emotions, and uh, that also forced majority of human population to do heavy introspection uh, on what is truly important and uh, what they want. And another thing that uh, has been uh, strongly forbidden for us is control over our lives. Um, so that obviously is going to be heavily manifested in any kind of consumer behavior right now. And uh, the next thing was the aspect of uh, reduction of feeling of belongingness, because um, obviously we weren't able to con um, sort of contact um, as much as we want, or at least in a more visceral manner, uh, our families and friends. So what we have been obviously seeing with the uh, with the impact of um, you know of the existential threat is that we have sort of two ways of moving um, our behavior. It's either we become more indulgent and impulsive, and this is, for example, what we have uh, seen. Um, great thing that everyone was very shocked about. The or was it? I think two point seven million uh, sales to Hermes in the first day when they opened in China. That's the example of it, but that's also the example of that sensation of freedom and an ability to be able to control some part of my life. 
And then the second level is be moral uh, and pro-social. Uh, that also includes sustainability and local consumption, which obviously has um, sort of increased. Um, but one thing that um, you know that we obviously kind of were also very much missing is that excitement and entertainment and fun and sensory stimulation and you know that kind of social impact and the things that are truly different um, because everything was the same, the same room, the same wall as like boring basically. So we're really going to heavily need differentiation and you know, and that's something that retailers are going to have to really think about on how we're going to do that, especially that we have a much higher uh, threshold of accepting change. So those are just lots of those things, as you can see in that matrix, and that's still a very minuscule amount of what's going on in our heads. Mm -hmm. So, so Taz, you come from a, um, a slightly different background as well with just behavioral economics, behavioral science. I guess, what's your view on where we are as, as customers, as human beings? Yeah, I think given that we've got a panel for whom probably we're all going to be violently agreeing, um, let me just take a slightly different attack because I, I, I endorse most of everything that, that Kay said. As you say, I come from a sort of behavioural economics storytelling background. Also, I'm used to working as an advertising agency planner with brands, positioning, communications. And I think for me, I, I talk about climbing Mount Maslow. So if we go to Maslow's, we, we shouldn't call it a pyramid, by the way, because it's two dimensions. It's just a triangle. Right. But everyone in particular, everyone in advertising likes to add depth to everything. So they'll say it's a pyramid. But it's a triangle. So I think what's happened is that we've slid down the last three or four months. We've all, as a as a as a species, really, we slid down to the bottom of that of that uh, triangle, which was all about safety and security and physiological needs. And I think what we're all now trying to do is work out how we climb to the top of that pyramid, that triangle again. And for me, at the top, I didn't like self-actualization. It's a bit too sort of young, really. And I think maybe a bit too early in the morning for a lot of you to talk about Carl Jung. So the word that I like using is meaning. I think what people want in life is meaning. Um, they want to understand how they fit into the world, as, as Kate said, how they can have control or agency. So for me, a lot of this meaning comes from community. And I think what retail has got to do is got to go back to some of those values that stores and communities and high streets were all about about belonging, about the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. I often use a definition of a brand. A brand for me is a tribe of shared meaning. So I think a lot of retail stores and beyond retail, frankly, have got to understand what those shared meanings are and understand how they can link into that sense of community to bring us all out and enjoy a greater sense of meaning as individuals, as a society. Great. So, and, and Ian, so what else are you observing um, of, of needs that perhaps we haven't addressed so far? I mean, it's really interesting, both Kate and Taz, um, you know, captured, captured a lot there and I agree with all of them. I mean, the one thing I notice is this kind of uh, duality, right? We're playing with kind of two opposing um, forces within and, and from 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 outside, you know, and I think that duality exists in many situations. And for me, that's that dilemma that I have, you know, do I have the do I have the the, the virus or do I want to spread the virus? You know, whereas I want to be quite selfish or do I want to be quite you know, focused on society and this kind of duality that we play with um, internally. And I guess the thing I'm starting to recognize personally, and I see it, um, I think we all have those challenges and those those moments, right? Do I wear a mask? Do I not wear a mask? Do I social distance? Do I stop most? Do I not social distance? Like this, this kind of duality is playing out in, in every scenario. I'm having this dilemma within an internal dilemma, and I'm questioning everything. I think the thing I, I recognize the most is, is it's actually okay to have that dilemma right we're, we're actually I think everyone is going through that that same place all the time and um, once you start to recognize that that questions those questions you're asking yourself you know you can kind of start to sit at ease everyone is going through those same kinds of dilemmas and questions um, from within you know I, I have a very optimistic point of view and I have a very pessimistic outlook as well and so that that's that's good I think that's going to nurture a lot of um, you know going back to Taz's point that's going to bring us all together we're all experiencing those same kind of emotions yeah because I definitely have a, 
observe that well myself it's I think it's like day to day the emotions are a different story um, as well as probably a lot of people are having this conflict between um, the safety of my home and wanting to go outside and be a part of society again and start to enjoy some of the old indulgences of our former lives so definitely see that duality um, I guess I'm also just sticking on the topic of um, where we are as human beings and kind of where we are on this journey. I do want to take a little bit of a of a of a some time to focus on what things we think will stick around for a little bit longer than this current time period. So I want to do that in the form of a game um, called Here to Stay or Going Away. So it's going to be, I mean, we talked about some of the needs, but I want to think about how that translates to our behaviors and how that it impact retail, I think, in the next coming months and as well as 12 to 18 months away. So in the game of here to stay or going away, um, I'm going to just list off a behavior that we've been observing. Obviously, it's not going to apply to all people, but it's definitely a trend. And when I ask you, you'll basically just answer if you think it's, it's here to stay, meaning beyond late 2020 or going away. And if any of the panelists disagree, then just raise your hand and we can quickly debate as, as to why that is. So it's gonna be rapid fire, okay? So we'll start the first one, Taz. Ready, Taz? I'm ready, <laughs> off you go. Okay. Um, so as the behavioral scientist here, uh, lockdown and safety guidelines, do we think that's here to stay or going away? Can I just preface anything I say with a quote from, I think an American baseball coach called Yogi Berra. He said, it's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, I, think, I think all of these things are gonna be segmented. I think you're gonna see a spectrum of different views, as you, as you said. Um, I think people are, a lot of people who've been shielding, a lot of people who've been looking after themselves are gonna be much more patient. They are gonna be much less ready to go out and, and sort of let go of sort of control and self sort of restrictions that they've had. So again, I think there's going to be a range of behaviours, but I, I think that could be here for a while. That they will be patient and compliant. I, I think patient compliant is another, I think they're two different things. <laughs> I think there is a, great, a, great, a number of people who want to be compliant. It might even be an age thing. Um, but I think a lot, see of, a lot of COVID are, rage come out of that. Passion. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I, I think that is a very grady, graded, gradient <laughs> spectrum, that one. Um, yeah. And I don't want to get up into the an age thing because otherwise my children will get angry. So, yeah, right. I also kind of uh, I agree with what I said, uh, but I also feel there's going to be sort of a wave. Um, but there will be a time now where we sort of accepting it more, and it's you know it's fine, and then we kind of gonna go nuts a little bit, and then again accepting, and it's a kind of you know just that duality what you said, Ian. It just kind of also you know, not only existing in groups of people, but also within a, a period of time until we sort of find that balanced middle where we all happy. And that's something that also I believe retailers should pay attention to as a sort of almost like a customer research uh, piece of what they need to change so that, you know, wave becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. Okay. So Ian, Ooh. ready? Okay. Hands on the buzzer. Yes. Reluctant. Yeah. And remember, remember, we have to keep this rapid fire. Okay. Okay, so reluctance to be in public in closed spaces for extended period of time. It's going away. It'll be here for the, the immediate um, as we transition into, into something, but in the long term, that will not be um, part of the new normal. Okay, any disagreement? Can I just take some points away from Ian for saying the new normal? Yeah. <laughs> We okay. can expect that, Taz, definitely. Yeah. I got it away early, Taz, Sorry, so I'm just we can't say it again, <laughs> I promise. Okay. Um, all right, Kate. Um, avoidance of or negative association tied to touch. I hope it's going away, <laughs> meaning uh, it very much unfortunately depends on what uh, strategies retailers will use. Um, because if they're going to use what is currently being used, um, you basically strengthening the avoidance to touch. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if you present touch through other senses, and that's possible, there is plenty of uh, cross-modal research that shows how you can indicate uh, um, a perception of touch through scent, sound, uh, or visual uh, mediums. 
then uh, we will again become a little bit more comfortable in that way for that. Hey, do you think there's going to be some learned behaviors as well? Like touch will come back, but we we won't touch our faces as much. We'll hand sanitize ourselves more frequently. So, you know, learned behaviors will will give us more confidence in that touching realm because I think we're we're all human and we like to touch and browse and poke things. For me, the favorite question, uh, answer to any question is it depends. And that's going to be very much dependent on a person's psyche and uh, their motivations for various things. Uh, and also their ability to, uh, to change their existing behaviors, because some people are less comfortable with changing current routines uh, and rituals that they have. Can I, can I show you something? I don't know whether I can share this on screen, Sandy. I'd like to sort of show you a system one, system two thing on that one, behavioral economics. I'll have a go at showing my... <laughs> my laptop, uh, okay. my, my PowerPoint. Um, I want to show you this. Can you, if you can see that, everybody. Uh, yeah. This is a, a system one approach to um, avoiding touch, getting people to actually realize there are germs everywhere. And I think this is quite an interesting system one um, um, theory or, or principle. The idea being rather than telling people don't touch things, you, you, you physically put these stickers on things and it just creates that sense that unconscious sense of talking to the system one unconsciously of actually every time you're touching something, oh. So I think actually these things can be learned, but I think some of the behavioral science nudges that have been used to do that might be worth, uh, worth examining a little bit more broadly as well. Yeah, I agree completely, Tess. It's, you know, the, the power of subconsciousness is something that has been considerably undervalued yeah. in uh, in design uh, and in experience. Uh, and you know that very well, Ian, you're trying to input that as much as possible into your projects. Uh, and clients sometimes are just reluctant because they don't understand it. But mm -hmm. those that do understand it, it does work really beautifully. And, yeah. you know, I, I had an amazing experience working with Swarovski in precisely the same manner. And Oh my goodness, the amount of little tiny things that you wouldn't even realize that we put it into that store are just absolutely incredible. Uh, it's, it's so easy, but we also have to be very careful to us. I love that solution, but we have to be very careful not to further enhance the fear and an anxiety because mm -hmm. that also is extremely detrimental to our obedience uh, to behaviors, uh, but also to our overall experience and likelihood of buying. So there yeah. needs to be that balance that we need to kind of yeah. find that is telling people what to do in a very intuitive manner, that very kind of subconscious manner, but at the same time, enhancing their experience and creating yeah. and evoking a lot of positive emotions. And, and the not, examples you use there, sorry to interrupt, Sandy, but the examples you used, Taz, were quite interesting. You had one which was, you know, black and yellow, which kind of evoked fear. And then yeah. you had another one which, which captured wit and play and fun. And so, you know, that delicate balance or that line that we, we want to um, um, walk down in some ways, we, we don't wanna to go to the fear side. We wanna be on that side, which is communicative and fun and engaging and um, in essence, changing the behavior because, because it's done well, right? Not, not the yeah. fear. I mean, I showed that and that was from early on in the sort of the pandemic. That was very much sort of creating a social norm around, you know, stay, um, um, stay indoors, stay home, protect the NHS. So it was very much at that stage. You're right. I don't know if we should read anything to the fact that you're, you're wearing yellow, Ian, as well. So I don't <laughs> stay away. Stay it's, away. It's not black, though. Tell us we're OK. Stay away from Ian. I'm toxic. Right, very, very well done, Tats. Humor is the breaker of all fear and anxiety. That's what we need more in retail. If you That's could spend an hour talking about humor, I would, trust me. But I Go so. on, let's do that. All right, let's, let's um, move on to one of the next ones. So we'll do this for, um, for let's, let's go for Ian. Okay, oh ready? Yeah, I'll be quick. All right, all right yes, hello. okay. Man in yellow, all right. Tolerance for suboptimal customer, customer experiences. So things like slower retail, longer delivery times, um, obviously queuing, we're seeing that here, um, and streamlining yeah. our choices, right? So this that essentially a reduced, yeah. a reduced watered down version of the experience. Yeah, that tolerance will, will go away 
where we're accepting of it now, but it will not stay. We, we want good things in our lives. We, we have high expectations. Um, I will not accept a store that is not filled with things for me to browse with. I will not accept a long lineup to wait to get into store. I'm okay with it now because I haven't had those things for a long time, but in the long run, um, our tolerance will um, go away and we'll have the same high expectations that were growing um, pre-COVID. Yeah, or even I'm higher. Talking, yeah, yeah, even I'm higher. Complaining again. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Sandy. I'm saying I'm sure we'll start complaining again. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No, we won't. Definitely going to come back. No, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, all right. Taz, ready? Yeah. Okay, so this is one trade-off, really, of the desire for hygiene, public health, trumping sustainability. So things like we're actually using more single-use plastics, um, things like that. I Okay, I have a bit of a rant about this because uh, Greta who? Okay, I'm, I'm, slightly, I'm slightly cynical about the whole eco thing. I mean, there is a very, very clear segment of people for whom sustainability and eco and green is important. I, I'm, I'm slightly, as I say, I'm slightly suspicious that that really isn't going to spread. I, I think I have a little saying, which is ego beats eco. I think for an awful lot of people, how we make, what makes us feel good, what makes us feel that we're in control, what gives us meaning, what makes us happy, what gives us fun, overcomes, I won't use the word trumps, that overcomes the need for the globe and to be sustainable. So I'm, I'm not that sure that sustainability is gonna be a big thing. I think, again, it will, will go back and people will worry a bit about it but I think it's still gonna be about us as individuals. Sorry. And so, and so just to flavor that question, um, not to, okay, so, so I know okay, I see Kate is disagreeing. Um, so I just, I wanna, add, I wanna add one component in your response is that if we tie that into other values, right? So buying hmm. based off of um, what they did during the pandemic or um, inclusivity and things like that, that we tie to our values. Um, which in, can include sustainability, I guess. Yeah, I think, I think yeah. values, not value, but values. And, and it goes again back to what I started off saying about meaning. I think as long as things are, give us a sense of meaning and belonging and tune into those sorts of emotional system one tribal things, yes. As I say, my only slight cynicism is the extent to which everyone is going to go off and, and, and suddenly save the world. I think there are, there are going to be lots of solutions that are going to be technical, I think, or technological, rather than um, everyone suddenly, you know, saying how wonderfully green they are. So if, yeah. I'm happy to go, I'm happy to be arch cynicist, cynic, if you want to go and <laughs> oppose that yeah. line. All right, so Kate, you I, um, yeah, So I, on one hand, agree with uh, Tas, uh, but on the other hand, precisely what you, Sandy, said is, depends how we embroider and uh, envelop uh, the sustainability product or service. So if you look at absolutely any research around sustainable consumption or collaborative consumption, are they... Um, the wanting to save the, the world and the environment is the least motivating factor of purchasing uh, any kind of sustainable products. Everything else that's precisely kind of going back to what you said to us about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, everything else that goes above and especially community intimacy relationships right now, because those ones, those ones were forbidden for us, but we sort of found more meaning from them. If you envelop sustainability in that, then yes. So it's less dependent on what we actually want and more dependent on how uh, a brand will package it. However, there is also really cool research that shows to us, and a lot of it, uh, that uh, when we are faced with existential threats, um, so the principle of mor mortality, salience, and terror management theory, we actually yeah. uh, are much more likely to be more sustainable uh, as well. And there is crazy amounts of research mm -hmm. on that as well. But there is certain tricks within there. There are certain dependencies. So it's not just black and white, yes, kind of face someone with mortal danger and they're going to be more sustainable. No, it doesn't work that way. But there is a way of making us more sustainable. So it's less about in you know in a customer's control more about the brands actually asking themselves um you know what kind of impact do i actually want to have in the world what is my responsibility in this world 
and what am I going to do with that and how am I going to educate or slightly influence my customers to do the good stuff. Uh, and that, unfortunately, like we were talking in our previous kind of pre-chats, that also demands changing of internal structures and uh, the mm. reasons for which um, the boards and directors are getting bonuses, not for just profits, but also for actually making a better impact in this world, because mm. that's why your customers are coming to you, not just because you have a lovely or nice or well-designed or scarce or limited edition product. Mm. Uh, that's the reason why we will be coming in, but you need to package it. Okay, that's great. Um, so just one last, one last example. Um, so Ian, ready? Hands on the buzzers. <laughs> okay, so the last one I'd like to talk about is just um, self-sufficient me. Um, so things like keeping up with new hobbies um, and skills that perhaps we were learning during the pandemic, taking on all of these new hats at home, whether that's chef, teacher, hairstylist for the whole family. Are we going to keep that self-sufficiency up? I, I think we are. I think um, we've all amazed ourselves by the things that we can actually do that we didn't think we could do, you know? And, um, you know, you go back to um, um, uh, Maslow's pyramid, Taz pyramid of, of needs. Um, this this sort of notion of uh, transfer, you know, transformational um, growth. You know, we've all gained a lot of uh, value and meaning from those um, from learning new skills, right? And I think there's a huge opportunity for brands to kind of leverage that in the home, right? There's a huge, there's a whole um, aspect of the of the of the branded experience that can now happen in the home. Right, which has not been explored in, in any way. Bring back the, the the old Tupperware party, right? And I think um, so. That's going to stay. I think that's going to stay and grow. And we've got too much value out of that, um, not just by the growth that we have, but how we're sharing those with our family as well. So I think there, there's there's so many good aspects um, to that. Not not for everyone, as we've said. This is kind of the general mood. I think we're going to um, have uh, going forward. But yeah, they're going to stay. I'm going to stick with that. I slightly disagree. <laughs> I was going to say, tell that to my Coursera course that I'm still on like lesson two. <laughs> um, all right. Um, does anyone else, I guess Kate or Taz, want to chime in or disagree? I wouldn't mind, yeah, I wouldn't mind just picking up on what Kate said about, because one of the things I, I'm interested in stories and storytelling and brand character and brand personality. And again, we talked about this before, you know, in the rehearsal. Um, and we, I think we all sort of, again, converged on this point, which is that I think a lot of, of, of retailers, particularly their boards, as Kate said, the higher up people, have got to stop seeing everything in terms of transactions. Um, I'm not going to use the word experience because, again, I think that becomes slightly um, cliched and slightly empty. But again, I think we need to look at the sort of the language and the, the tone of voice. I mean, I don't want to hear about convenience and frictionless and seamlessness. You know, I'm, I'm not a great fan, particularly, of, of brand purpose which again, you know, may set another hair running for about an hour. But, but I do want to look at personality and character and language, style and tone of voice. And again, I think some of the, of the retailers and companies that have done well through the pan pandemic have done well because of tone of voice, because they've understood the sort of language, the sort of feeling, the sort of proximity or distance to get with consumers. They haven't done this very transactional parent-child language. And again, I think sometimes governments and companies are very, very bad at doing that. Um, so I think that's a really important thing for retailers to understand. It's not just about their content. It's not just about what they say or what they stock. It's about how they do it. It's the isn't language, that, the design. Isn't that attached to purpose, Taz, though, fundamentally? It's, you know... I it can Not be, but exactly. Um, so what I, I completely agree with you, Tas. I'm like one of the absolute first things that I always do with my clients is dig into their brand personality. And more often than not, that demands me creation of an actual fully personalized brand personality questionnaire for them. Uh, yes, using still Jennifer Acker's one and other ones that are out there, but no. still kind of going there. And I want to stretch farther what you just said to not just tone of voice, but also design. What has been failing is uh, the very standardized signage and design solutions that, um, you know, that only instill fear and have no kind of branded uh, feeling, no branded characteristics 
no branded humor or anything like that. And that, you know, that's where kind of the biggest issue is, because those that kind of really played on it a little bit, then at least they actually got people to pay attention and feel slightly less afraid and maybe just feel as if they can have a game with those signage as opposed to, you know, just follow it blindly because they said so. Um, so it's, you know, it's not exactly as, um, you know, as easy. And going back to what you, Ian, said, uh, on one hand, and I, I agree on the one hand, I don't, in a sense that only those things that we truly found a unique meaning and inspiration of in uh, that we truly discovered that are, for example, the best way to improve our well-being and mental health or to create a better relationship with our children or any other family members, those will stay. The rest is just, a, oh my goodness, that's a hassle to do. I'm sorry, but I'm really missing a hairdresser and a beautician and lots of other things. I'm like, and I'm certainly not going to touch it myself because it's easier for you guys not so easy with this. <laughs> I'm like, it's really basics. I'm like, those things that are truly hassle uh, for us, they will go back to, you know, to the people that are professionals in it. That's what they trained in. Those that truly we gain the meaning in, such as maybe, you know, um, I don't know, spending more time with our children and playing some games or, you know, uh, okay, or doesn't it taking more uh, beauty routines that we didn't. So really sort of taking care of ourselves and indulging ourselves, or I don't know, writing in a happiness journal or whatever it is, uh, all those things. Uh, but I'm certainly not going to continue baking bread uh, because I don't freaking have the time for it. So it's, you know, we really need to kind of, you know, find what's the trade-off and how much of a value particular activity uh, delivers. And that activity that delivers higher value yes can be supported by the brand and yes can be included as part of a at home brand experience but, but kate isn't it the fact that we now have that as an option to choose from you know oh, four yeah. months ago we didn't have that as an option really in our in our sphere of things that we liked or could like you know now we've tested things tried things we don't like we've cast some aside kept some and and for me it's that kind of that recognize um you know we've now recognized there are things at home i can do there are things that that i can i can add value to my to my life um whereas before i'm not sure that was as as, as a big part of our lives now yes lots won't stick around for sure but some yes. will and that option um, now i have now have an option i think is the thing i like about it yeah and an option and choice is a manifestation of lack of control and the more we will be giving control to people in other spheres of our life the less yeah. we will need to claim that control in those activities that's my reasoning behind what hmm. i earlier said I, can i just pick out one yeah First of all, um, it's taken us half an hour to talk about baking and having a head um, which I think is a very Zoom record. Um, <laughs> no one's mentioned Pilates yet, so I'm just going to say Pilates. Um, I just want to bring up one point, which sort of is a thread. Obviously, I talk about storytelling, we need threads. So here's a thread that I think is running through. One of the key emotions for me is surprise. Um, it's one of the most basic human instincts, curiosity, surprise. And I think... Ian and I, when we were talking before about design and, and designing that in, I think one of the things that people have found through the lockdown is they found ways to surprise themselves, whether it is doing their own hair, whether it is baking bread. And again, it's something I would urge retailers to think about. How can you, I was going to say bake in, apologies, how can you bake in more surprise? I often use the word serendipity in my, in my second book, The Inspiratorium, which is all about how insight comes about by making new connections. I would definitely advise all retailers to think about how they can encourage people's sense of surprise and curiosity in store, how you guide people, how you perhaps break up the things that they're expecting to see, give it to them, but give it to them in a way that creates that sense of surprise and curiosity. Because I think people are desperate. They're desperate for meaning, they're desperate for happiness, but they're also desperate for a bit of surprise. Yes, that's a great point. And I think that actually ties quite well into let's now start talking about how this is all these changed behaviors, expectations are translating to the actual retail environment that we're seeing. So here, obviously, in the UK, we're um, a bit of a, a bit of, of a different timeline than other markets like the US. But um, with that context in mind, based off of what you've seen of as far as 
the stores that have reopened or businesses that have reopened on a scale of one to 10, um, one being complete disaster and 10 being mind blowing, how would you rate the reopening strategies you've seen re retailers implement um, and, and briefly why, why is that? So um, if we start with Kate, it has three. Ooh. Taz, what's your number? Um, I think about four or five, four or five, four and, and a half. Okay, so three and, and four and point, 4.5 and Ian? Two, I'm gonna go with two. two. Oh, yeah. okay, so, low ball. Okay, four about a three. Harsh, harsh. Mine, mine is like, a, I would say two as well. Um, all right, so I guess, well, it's, you all had a very similar low scores. So, um, so Ian, why would, you, why would you have rated them so low? Well, I haven't. I've seen one or two that are that are that are interesting, but they and they touch on what Taz talked about. They've they've actually done some unique things. They've looked at the the situation that's happening and they've responded to those behaviors. Um, but not enough of them. Too many of them think it's business as usual, right? And they've they they haven't rethought exactly how retail fits in anymore. Mm -hmm. And it seems that everything is very tactical, very utilitarian, very functional. It's about getting the doors open and trading and. And I get that, right? It's it is it is where we are in that um, phased approach, right? Like we're going to go through this where people get the doors open and people start getting comfortable, and there will be more understanding of, of what people want of their of their retail stores um, in the future. But I just think there's been so much focus on just getting the doors opening. Um, a little bit around safety, a little around trust, and not around um, really what stores um, provide us, right? They give us a lot of, um, of, of, of really amazing experiences, whether those are social or uh, um, educational or entertainment, like none of that is back in our stores. It seems very controlled and contrived. Everything is around safety, um, not even around uh, trust and confidence, things are around safety, right? And there's a real um, kind of under underlining um, um, action. And I get it, we wanna, we wanna embed that safety for our customers and, and our staff working there, but um, much more can be done. People think to need to think in a, in a much more uh, dynamic, dynamic way. And so I see too much of the same everywhere. You can't remove, you know, no touch doesn't mean no experience, right? Like if you remove all the products from your store, um, and, and just focus on the customer um, engagement in terms of the human interaction. Maybe that's what people need right now at the moment. But they, if there's nothing to actually do in those stores and just talk to people, well, then will they come back? And so I think there hasn't been a, a lot of thought um, gone into the, the the longer term impact of delivering a store which is underwhelming. Like, what does it actually mean? People go into a store that is that is um, underwhelming. Will people come back? Right. And so, some of the strategies I like are people not opening their stores because they're not yeah. ready. Right. They actually haven't figured it out yet. So, I'm not just about trading and selling you products. I'm about delivering good customer experiences. Right. And those ones that are taking their time thinking about how to do that, those are the ones I quite I, I find quite interesting. You know, they're very brave. Like their shareholders can't can't like that situation where they're not actually trading from from their stores. But I think those taking their time thinking about what's actually needed, thinking about where they want to position retail in the future um, is really kind of exciting. Um, yeah. I so agree with you, Ian. Um, I'm like, um, one thing that I, however, want to pay attention to is we need to empathize with the fact that all of the decision makers are in the same state of fear and anxiety that we've all been living with. Um, and on top of that, they have demand from boards and their directors to sell, 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 because they all also are afraid of losing their jobs and everything else. So the one major thing that I would truly encourage all the leaders to do is to introspect whether the decisions that they're making on uh, creation of that experience and introduction of the safety regulation is purely based uh, on their fear or is purely based on really creating an amazing experience, even if you're not going to sell a lot for the first week or two. Because sales will come back if you're going to have an amazing experience. Um, I certainly, one thing that I really liked was Ann Summers decided to open a store a day at the beginning. Um, 
to kind of learn from every single store that they were opening to see what else they can do. Um, I liked the fact that Selfridges decided to have a band, a jazz band for the Cures. I'm not saying it's, um, you know, major thing to do, but bigger than anyone else kind of decided mm. to do. Uh, hey. But I'm certainly extremely proud of my client, um, Dowsing and Reynolds. Uh, and I spent with them purely an hour with the founders on the phone, um, give them ideas, and they truly rolled with it. They have a store in Victoria Quarters in Leeds. And one thing that I really liked was um, that they truly made sure that all of the sort of safety solutions are fully branded, that they fully make sense, including... Uh, their sort of background to all of their brands and their store is uh, is black. So including having black face masks, black hand, uh, black gloves, uh, black uh, hand, um, you know, uh, soap dispenser for uh, uh, sanitizer. But we've also introduced uh, various kind of uh, interactive um, aspects using principles from Gestalt psychology. Uh, as well as using their signature moth um, and uh, and also an ability for customers to actually play with the product, uh, obviously that being sanitized before and after that play uh, exists uh, and in including disposable trays. So those are not crazy big and crazy expensive solutions. And yes, might not work for big, uh, um, you know, kind of football brands, but even just kind of branding your signage uh, as opposed to making it purely fear inducing, that can work uh, majorly. Hey, Kate, that starts I'm to not even Sorry? What you've what you've done there is start to um, by by being considered and adding quality to the by using design to add quality and consider every step, right? You're starting to build confidence and trust, right? And those are just simple things. Rather than fear, you're building confidence, yeah. right? And that that's a subtle shift. But when you use design to add consideration, do be thoughtful. Be thoughtful about it. It's it's not rocket science. Just think about it, right? And, and when you do that, you shift the whole experience away from fear and you start to build confidence. We've got you. We've we we've got you covered, right? That whole notion around confidence. And I think it's really nice. These just these little interventions can work as long as they're thoughtful. And I think like also example. your brand yeah. personality. I'm like, come on, brains view brands as human beings. If you wouldn't wear that sticker on your head, don't put it on. I'm like, that's literally how brain works. So I think yeah. we're um have just a few minutes. So I just want to make sure um I guess just one comment on on Kate's on on the Selfridges site. I was there that week when they opened, and I think what stood out as well as like they were trying to create a feeling that was around uplifting your spirits, um, which I think is quite different to as you said, trying to reassure and and around safety. Um, so it's, sorry, just one last point on Taz, and then um, we'll have one final question. Yeah, I'm just going to show you if I can find this uh, picture wherever it is. Uh... Where is it now? Da, 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 da. This is um, a, a motorway service station in the UK, um, which was just putting up a sign. Oh, hang on, I've got to share the screen, sorry. Um, this was just putting up a, a sign um, outside. And I, I just like the tone of voice. It's, it's not formal, it's not transactional, it's not parent-child. It's sweet, it's about being kind. It's just about sort of, as I say, being quite informal. Mm -hmm. It's almost a level of sort of conversational and, and banter. And I don't want to make too much of it. It's only a small thing outside. But, but I think these things matter. And it goes back to something, again, that's, that's a thread to all of this, which is stops worrying so much about being transactional and, and didactic. And again, I think, you know, in court talks, it talks about fear. This, this didactic thing about saying to people, you must do this, you must not do that. Just be a little bit more empathetic, be a little bit more supportive and conversational. You've touched on something very essential there, though, Taz, and we probably don't have time to go into this, but um, the retail store as we know it is not going to be transactional. It's not a sales channel anymore, right? It, 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 it is a moment along a pathway to purchase, as there are many moments underpinned by a technological digital platform. But the store as we know it doesn't, doesn't exist. It's no longer where you pick up your goods right or pick your goods off a shelf and this this notion the sooner people realize that i think the closer we get to to having much more exciting and engaging delightful surprising experiences for that people are craving 
yeah. yeah. Right. So I, I think agree. A lot of um, I just make one last point. Um, and I, I also encourage you to not think like all the solutions you're creating have to be final. Uh, it's all about incremental uh, improvements, constantly going and making it better and better and better for your customers, uh, and really sort of you know checking it, testing it, and going uh, over and over again. I'm like those things have been already happening. The aspects of flexibility or mobility of um, you know of retail concepts. It's not a new thing, but we need to kind of make it even more flexible. Uh, I would love to ask you, my colleague Alice will be sharing on the comment uh, boxes a survey uh, that will help us with insights for a new tool that we're developing um, that will uh, help to create truly incredible and maintain and sort of incrementally improve um, an amazing customer experience in physical retail. So please, as many of you, if you can fill that in, especially if you store director, I would really appreciate that. Thank you so much for that. Okay, I know we have to um, quickly um, wrap up, but um, I, I think we started off with the customer and where they've where they've changed um, some of our new new habits, new behaviors that some will stick around, some will not. Um, I'm thinking about how that translates to the, the customer experience. And I think a lot of it is just really challenging um, retailers, brands to um, kind of even just an existential question, like, why am I here? What What is the role of my store? And how can I embed more of the storytelling that Taz is always talking about um, and thinking about how, how you include that element of surprise um, and make things not so transactional and focus on, on safety. So I think we touched on a lot of the points, but we could talk for, I think, two or three more hours on this. Um, we have so many more questions we didn't cover, but um, thank you so much, Kate, Taz, and, and Ian, and we'll just hand it over back to um, PSFK. Um, but thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.